Okay, thank you again for joining me. Um, we made a start to a Mishnah on Daf Membe Summit Base 42b uh, last week, and we got really into that Mishnah, quite a way into that Mishnah. This is a new Perik, the Perik Lulav the uh, Arava. And um, we, uh, we found that this Mishnah introduces us to something like seven different mitzvot of uh, the Sukkot season, not just Lulav and Esrig and um, the Sukkah itself, but all sorts of subsidiary mitzvahs that were part of the uh, um, activities at the, certainly at the time of the Beis HaMikdosh, uh, most of which we have now lost, some of which are established again today um, in some sort of similar fashion, but not quite at the level at which they were practiced at the time of the Beis HaMikdosh. And I'll take us through the Mishnah again, and I'll clarify a few pieces here as well, and um, introduce a few pictures as well to help uh, brighten up the, uh, the day, um, introduce a bit of technicolor into the proceedings. Let me start from that Mishnah again. That Mishnah is in the middle of the uh, 42b, starts a new Perik. Lulava Arava, Shisha Beshiva. So the, the Mishnah is going to bring up a number of different mitzvot of, um, of Sukkot and also tell you how many days out of the seven day period they would be practiced for. And sometimes it was for eight days uh, if we're including Shmini Atzeris. Um, and this will depend upon when Shabbat falls. Shabbat sometimes cancels a particular mitzvah. As we find today that we don't take Lulav and Esrik or blow shofar uh, on Shabbos, even though it happens to be Rosh Hashanah, and we should blow shofar or Sukkot, and we should take Lulav and Esrik, but we don't. So um, that is going to determine to some extent how, the, uh, how many days that particular mitzvah is practiced. So let's start the Mishnah again. Lulav Arava. Shisha Veshiva. Here are the Lulav is the mitzvah's Lulav that we know, the mitzvah of Arba Minim, which is referred to here um, by mitzvah's uh, Lulav, but it means the Esrig, etc., etc. It could be six days and it could be seven days. And, and also when it comes to the Arava, and we'll look at this separately again, the Lulav, why six or seven? Well, the Gemara is actually going to explain, um, but at the time of the Beis HaMikdosh, um, even though um, in Yerushalayim or in the uh, Har Habayis or however you want to understand the Mishnah, there were seven days in which the Lulav uh, and Esrig were taken, a Minha Torah, and on the first day it was taken as well, even though it was a Shabbos. Nevertheless, if Shabbos fell not on the first day, but on the seventh day, for example, or another day, then it would not be taken on that day. So um, if Shabbos falls on the first day of Sukkot, it was taken all seven days. If you like, the mitzvah of, Sukkot, of, of taking the Arba Minim overrode the Issa of, um, of whatever might stand in its way, such as uh, you might be carrying it to Shul. Well, you have to make sure you don't carry it, you leave it there. But we're not concerned about all the risks and the lulav is, is, is taken on all seven days if the first day is Shabbos. But if the if a subsequent day was Shabbos, even though there was a mitzvah to take lulav all seven days, it did not override the Isurim of Shabbos. The Gemara itself is going to ask a question, why not? If you say that a mitzvah should be taken all seven days, then it shouldn't make any difference whether, the, whether Shabbos falls on the first day or on the fifth day. You shouldn't take it. It should always be taken all six, only all seven days. And if you say that it doesn't override Shabbos, it should be taken always six days. So uh, we, we scratch our heads trying to find why only if the Shabbos falls on the first day um, that Lulav is taken even on the Shabbos. The Gomorrah itself is going to help us understand that. And the Arava. If you remember, I'm, I gave you a brief uh, view of what the mitzvah's arava was, and I'll just share my screen over here. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I, maybe I went through this passage with you as well, that um, there was a place below Yerushalayim, which even today we know as Mozart, and the Kohanim used to go down there 
um, and they would pick up these very, very long reeds, these very, very long arogots from the valley below. And then um, in the Beis Amikdash, they would uh, surround the Mizbeach and they would cast up, if you like, or set up these very long arogos to droop over the tall Mizbeach. And then they would sing, Ono Hashem of Shiona, Aniba Ho of Shiona, and, uh, <clears throat> and this is what they would do. Uh, we, we are parallel to days. We don't do this. We don't take one larger rubber and set it up and then surround them as fair. We take our little of an esrog and we go around each day and we call it Hoshana. So here we see the parallel that we have today to the original mitzvah, which was called the mitzvah of Arava which we don't, we don't keep in its full sense because we don't have them as bayat nowadays. We don't have the apparatus to allow us to carry out that particular mitzvah. And over here, I, I've included a picture. Actually, it's not as clear as it should be. I would have thought the Temple Institute, whoever has done this, has given us there. Look, at this is the Mizbeach. Here you can see the ramp going up. This is the top of the Mizbeach. You see a Kohanim on the top of the Mizbeach. And here you see an example of one of these very long arabot. It looks almost like a tree being set up, leaned against the Mizbeach, and the top um, branches actually overhang. So you can imagine that they set up a number of those. And that was the mitzvah of the Arava. That was the mitzvah of Arava. Then the, the Kohanim, where you can see here, they're trumpeting and fluting, and they would, and they would um, circumnavigate the, uh, um, the Mizbeach and sing. Uh, and, uh, and there would be a whole atmosphere of Simcha. So that was the mitzvah of Arava. And that was also um, done either six days or seven days, depending upon when Shabbos fell. And we will see that more clearly um, uh, in the Gemara, when the Gemara deals with this mitzvah of Arava, which we'll come to later on. The, mis the Mishnah went on to say, Ahalel, Bechein HaSimcha, Halel and Simcha, we have them over here. Um, just written them down. Halel is a mitzvah we Halel we have today. And also Simcha, the mitzvah of Simcha Sachag, is Shemona. That uh, prevails for, for eight days because Halil was said about all seven days of uh, Sukkot. Uh, Shabbos is irrelevant here. We would say Halil, and as we do today on Shabbos as well. And on Shemuni Atzeris, which is the eighth day, uh, which is really a Chag Ne'atzmo. It's really a festival of its, of its own, but it comes at the tail end of Sukkot. It's being treated here as if it were the tail end of of Sukkot, an appendage to Sukkot. That's also eight days, as well as Simcha, the Mitzvah of Simcha. And we described this last time as well, Mitzvah of Simcha, <clears throat> where um, I had an extract over the Torah says, Samachta, Rechagecha, and here it says, Ato, Vincha, Vitecha, Vaaktcha, Vamosecha, Vahalevi, Vahage, Vayosem, Asher Bisharecha. This is, this is where you all together have to be in Simcha together with the the people who are destitute, you have to invite them into your homes in order to enjoy Simcha with you. And Chazal said um, that there is a mitzvah, a person should um, uh, inculcate a sense of Simcha into his family um, on the regal, on every day of the regal. And Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, Rabbi Yehuda said, I'm not shim. Whatever, so to speak, turns a person on and makes them simchadik uh, is something that they need to equip themselves with uh, for, um, uh, for, for, for all the days of the Chag to make them feel the simcha. Uh, for men, the, the, this, this Mishnah said originally it was beyayin, but men like to drink wine and wish, and women, um, then they like to have uh, covered, uh, colored and uh, freshly laundered clothes. Women prefer clothes, men prefer wine. That's what the Mishnah said. And Rabbi Yehud ben Sarah went on to say um, that um, when the Beis HaMikdash was around, Ein Simcha Ela Babosa, meat, which referred to originally as the meat of the Shlomim, the carbon Shlomim that was brought to the Beis HaMikdash. The, the, the carbon meat was the primary manifestation of Simcha. People used to eat that. The owners of the Karbonas would eat that meat for Simcha. Um, now that we don't have a base hamikdash, ain simcha ela v'yayin. That was a corner of Yudim and Sarah again. That wine is v'yayin is samach levav enosh, very famous pasuk. So wine is important. But as we said before, gifts to the family, 
um, and uh, clothes for the women. Maybe nowadays it's books for the men, who knows? Uh, maybe it's a new mobile phone or whatever it is, although they can't use it on Shabbos and Yom Tov, something that engenders Simcha. Um, simcha is not just something that ought to be there because, it's, because it is a festival, but rather something we need to promote. Yes, it's something that requires um, promotion. It requires a catalyst. That catalyst may be wine, that catalyst may be meat, that catalyst may be new clothes or whatever it is, but it requires a cat catalyst. So that was the mitzvah of Simcha. And Simcha and Hallel were eight days. They're eight days long. Um, and of course, when you think about it, we say eight days, we often think of Simcha on the Yom Tov itself. But what about Cholom Yes, when we eat our meal, you know, we sing the Zomach Tov Gecha. But it's very clear that the Mitzvah Simcha applies equally during Cholom So even if you go, if you go out on a teal on, on Cholom I guess that also um, promotes some level of Simcha. You're doing something uh, new, and you're exploring the landscape or whatever it is, particularly in Eretz Yisrael. So that also um, uh, engenders simcha and is important. The, uh, let's go on to the mission. Sukkah v'nisuch hamayim, shiva. The mitzvah of sukkah and nisuch hamayim, the, the water libation, seven days. Well, sukkah, we know what that is, seven days. is the seven days of sukkah that we, uh, we sit in the sukkah. That, that doesn't change whether Shabbos is at one of those days or not. It's, it's, uh, we sit in the sukkah on Shabbos as well as um, during Cholomod, whenever it isn't Shabbos, it's, an, it's a seven day festival. Also, also the Nisuch HaMayim. <clears throat> Nisuch HaMayim was the special ceremony of pouring water onto the Mizbeach taken from the Shiloh stream down below in the city of David. That was um, accompanied by a, um, a fanfare of, uh, of, of, of instruments and uh, a great parade. Uh, and that was a very simple occasion. That was also all seven days. <clears throat> just um, introduce you to Nisel Hamayim. Second, I'm just making this a bit smaller. Let's see what's going on. See how colorful things are today. Sukkot was a very colorful festival, and I have some illustrations over here, courtesy usually of the, I'm not sure whether this is from the Temple Institute or whatever, let's just have a look. So the Mishnah actually elsewhere describes the Nisoch HaMayim. So we are actually going to participate in a, uh, um, the procession of the Nisoch HaMayim for the very first time. Although it's done in some, um, in some parallel fashion today, there's still a procedure where people go down to the Shiloh pool and pull out water and then they take it up and, 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 and enter into Yerushalayim. But this is, this is now going to be a, uh, uh, a reproduction of the real thing during the time of the Beis Amikdash. So the Mishnah says, There was a flask of gold which held three log, which is a smallish volume, like, like a large a decanter. Uh, of Hoyomamale min HaShiluch, and they used to fill that with water from the pool called the Shiluch. And here you have a very nice picture, uh, and you have a Cohen, see him over here? He's dipping his flask into the water of the Shiluch, and he's going to take this to the base Hamikdash. And if you look into the picture here, let me just magnify it a bit further. I'm sorry, sorry it's not a movie. Where is it? I think I magnified it too much. Um, you'll see that the Shiluach, here you can see is the city of David. You know, it slopes downwards. And at the top, right at the top, is the Harabais and the Beis Hamikdash. This is exactly the way things are today. This is the same perspective. If you were the Shiluach today, you would see just above you um, the terraces, so to speak, of the city of David, here David, and you would see at the top the walls of the Beis Hamikdash. And they would then carry this up in procession up the through the Ir David all the way to the Beis Hamikdash, which would have taken them maybe 10, 15 minutes, a little bit of a walk because it's, it's a climb. So that was the first part of it. They would fill it up from the Shaluach. Just reduce the size a moment. Okay. Higiu le Sharamayim, when this procession reached the gate of the Beis Amikdash, which was known as the Shar Hamayim, because it was the gate through which this water, this, this, this Nisoch Mayim flask, was carried 
toku beherio the toku takia terua takia you see <laughs> they 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 blew they blew shofar maybe trumpets as well to accompany it olaba kevesh ufonolasmolo they entered into the base of mikdash and then they ascended the ramp of the base of mikdash you know this diagonal upward ramp that we saw before ufonolasmolo and they turned towards the left of the top surface of the mizbeach at the top of the ramp and there there was ready in place already two silver buckets. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda said, shall sit how you. They were actually not silver buckets. They were sort of lime. They were pottery, maybe of some sort. But they looked dark, even though they were originally white, because they had their their faces were blackened because of wine which they had originally absorbed into their walls so they looked a bit like silver from the distance but they weren't silver and they had small holes each of these buckets had a small hole one small hole in each bucket um, one hole was bigger than the other and we'll describe why in a moment one of the wall one of the buckets had a wider hole, uh, an orifice, than the other. One of them was less wide. Why? In order that the flow of the liquids should both complete themselves at the same time. The Western one, as we said before, that was the bucket in which the water was put into. The eastern bucket, the one at the east end of the of the Mizbeach's surface platform, that was the one in which wine was brought, brought poured into. There is going to be both a water libation, that's a nisochamayim, and a line, a wine libation, that is the yayin, the yayinessa, the nisochayayin, and they're both going to happen at the same time. Now, this ceremony was the nisochamayim one. But it was to be um, sy synchronized with the Nisochayim. Let's see how that happened. Okay, so here's a picture. Here's another picture. Here you see the Kohanim. They're at the top of the Mizbech. They're at the top of the Mizbech. The Mizbech is very high. They fell off. They probably killed themselves. Here's the ramp. They had to go up. That's the edge of the ramp. So they would have to reach the top. Now, very interesting here. You have two Kohanim. One of the Kohanim. Uh, I'm not sure which is west and which is east over here. If you imagine that north is ahead, then west is on the left and east is on the right. There are two buckets. Actually, they should be silver. Naughty, naughty. We just said they were silver and not gold. These are considered to be the buckets. They may be a bit ornate, but they're considered to be the, the buckets. Here are two flasks. He's holding a flask here. That's a flask with the water taken from the Meishiluach. This Cohen is pouring wine, a wine libation. And they both pour their two liquids into these buckets. Here you can see them actually leaning over and you can see some of the wine dropping into the bucket. Here it doesn't, he maybe he's finished or he hasn't finished. This is all uh, the Temple Institute's impression. Um, and he may have already poured his water into the water bucket. These are going to be synchronized. They will start pouring these at the same time. Now here the Mishnah has given us an interesting observation. He's given us a lecture in, uh, in, in, uh, in physics in relation to the viscosity of the two types of liquid. Wine is going to be poured into here and the water is being poured into here. Both of these buckets, you cannot see this, but both of these buckets at the base of these buckets have a hole. And that hole, in both cases, is placed directly on top of the sort of drain of the top of the Zbeach. And if you like, that drain is going to carry the liquid that's poured into those buckets down into the base of the earth, or below the Zbeach, through drain, through, through a guttering system. So here already he's pouring the wine. That wine is not going to remain in the bucket. It's immediately going to drop through a hole, which we can't see happening. Um, down through the Mizbeach, right down to the base. And over here, the water is going to go through the hole at the base of the bucket down into the Mizbeach. 
What is interesting is they wanted the two flows of wine and water to leave both buckets empty at the same point in time. But there's one problem. That's what they wanted. Why? I don't know. So he told mitzvah that the wine and the water should, should leave the buckets at the same time. Not just leave the flasks at the same time, but actually finish their way through down the uh, invisible channel in the Mizbeh at the same time. However, there's a problem. Wine is more viscous, more honey-like, if you like, than water. And therefore, if they both entered into their two buckets at the same time, the wine would take longer to finish its way through the hole in the bottom than the water. The water would get through more quickly. So therefore, they deliberately made the hole in the wine bucket wider. And they obviously did some experiments such that it would take exactly the same time for the wine to get through its aperture at the base as it would take the water to get through its aperture at the base. It was a much smaller, finer hole here because water is less viscous and will get through the fine hole more quickly. Okay, so that's probably the first real um, description, you know, live description of the Nisoch Um That's the way I understand it anyway, from what, how I read it. So this was the Nisoch HaMaim, it was accompanied with great fanfare and music. Um, nowadays we have each day of Yom Tov this, what's called the Simchas Beis HaShoeva, you know, which is done in shuls or particularly amongst the Hasidim, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the rabbinical courts, you know, where thousands of people turn up um, and they sing and they drink and they put candles on and, and, you know, all this great merrymaking in the evenings, usually, sometimes during the day as well. Um, and that, in a sense, is meant to be this parallel of the libation of water, the Nisoch HaMaim. So you see, we have the remnants today of these particular um, rituals that were carried out very much more seriously uh, when the Beis HaMikdor was around. So that's a Nisoch HaMai. Now we go on with the, um, the next one. Hecholil, says the Mishnah, the flute. At the Simchas Beis HaShoeva, they blew various musical instruments. And here the Mishnah mentions Hecholil, which I think even today is used as a flute or something, it probably is. Um, Chamisha Shisha, either five days or six days. Well, first of all, let's have a look at the flute. According to the Temple Institute, I think this is what the flute looks like. I don't know if anyone's ever found any, um, but uh, that looks as though it's made of bone or something. Maybe it is made of bone. Maybe it's from a horn in the same way as a chauffeur is made of a horn. Anyway, you could probably have imagined it would look something like this. So the Khalil was taken either five or six days. And that's going to again depend when Shabbos falls. And we'll see later on exactly why it could be five or six. It wasn't seven. It was always nitch on Shabbos, but it could also be sometimes not on two days rather than just on one day. Um, it wasn't taken on Yontav either, which is why it's either five or six second because it, it wasn't the, the cholil was not blown as a musical instrument on the Yontav. Since the day of the Yontav, therefore, is out, the maximum is going to be six. It wasn't taken on Shabbos either, therefore, it was only taken on five days. It was only blown. So even though the Simchas Beis HaShoeva, we said before, was a seven-day festival, um, they omitted the use of these instruments to accompany the uh, parade on uh, Shabbos and on the day of Yontav itself. Okay. The Mishnah is going to go on now to describe um, a few other aspects, um, yeah, of lulav. Interesting uh, uh, halachos. Um, now, this one first is just a straightforward one. That's the next piece of the Mishnah. Lulav shiva ketzav. The Mishnah merely asks now, under what circumstances do we take the lulav seven days, all seven days, which is all seven days of Sukkot? because we said that the lulav would be either six or seven. So when do we take it for seven? And when do we take it for six? That's essentially what the Mishnah is going to explain. So lulav shiva ketza, under what circumstances is it taken all seven days? When yom tov rohorishon shalchag shachal yos bishats, lulav shiva. If the first day of Sukkot falls on Shabbos, then it is even taken Lulav and Esrig is even taken on Shabbos. It's taken all seven days. Of course, the Lulav has to be brought, as we'll see later on, 
to the base amygdala because we're not going to carry it on Shabbos, but it is taken on Shabbos if the first day is Shabbos. But what that means is if Shabbos falls on any other day, because Shabbos is going to fall on one of the days of the seven day festival, if it falls on any other days, Shisha, that it will only have been taken for six days because on the day that Shabbos falls, if it's not on the first day, it won't be taken. Um, and that'll be only six days. And we'll have to understand why there should be a difference. Remember again, this is puzzling because we said at the time of the Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, it was, there was a mitzvah in our Torah to take it seven days, in which case it should always be taken seven days. However, the Mishnah is taking, telling us over here, nevertheless, if the, it's only if the first day was Shabbos that it was taken for seven days and not if, if the, any other subsequent day was on Shabbos. It was not taken on that day of Shabbos if, if Shabbos fell on any other day. Um, and we'll see why um, that is the case. And the Mishnah now says, Arava b'mikdash shiva ketzad. When is it that this Arava, remember what we said before was the Arava, that was the very long um, Aravot that were placed along the side of the Mizbeach by the Kohanim, that original mitzvah, when is it taken all seven as opposed to six? Again, that will be either six or seven days. Ketzad, Yom Hashvi Shal Arava Shachol Lihiyos B'Shabbos. This is strange. Arava Shiva. Usha'ar Kol Yomim Shisha. Again, it's a, it's a detail that doesn't bother us today. But the Arava, this, this parade of the Arava placed against the side of the Zbeach was taken, was down for seven days, but only for seven days if the seventh day was Shabbos. So here, well, of a sudden, it's not the importance of the first day, but it's the seventh day. If the seventh day was Shabbos, then this Arava ceremony took place even on Shabbos, and therefore it was done for seven days. If the, se if the Shabbos fell on the first day or the sixth day or some other day, then it, that this Arava ceremony was not carried out. Therefore, it would only be carried out the sixth day. And we'll see later on why there's significance in the seventh day. Only for this mitzvah Arava, suddenly we find some, some specific relationship between um, the seventh day of Sukkot and the importance of this mitzvah of Arava. Um, remember today we have Hoshana Rabbah, which is the, uh, the seventh day. So this, our equivalent is to treat Hoshana Rabbah very seriously. So we see over here, the mitzvah Rabbah was taken more seriously. Arava, which is not the Hashanah Rabbah, uh, but Arava uh, was taken very seriously. Uh, even if it was on Shabbos, uh, but only that Shabbos was the seventh day, um, that mitzvah was taken very seriously. So we see another parallel here between the seventh day on Arava and the Hoshana Rabbah we have today. Okay. So the mission now is going to give us a historical um, picture of how the Lulav mitzvah, the Lulav mitzvah, we're going back to our Bermudian, was carried out on a Shabbos in the Beis HaMikdosh. If you remember, a few weeks ago, we discussed something similar. We said, how did they, how did they carry out the mitzvah of our Bermudian on Shabbos? In, the, in Yerushalayim during the time of Beis HaMikdash, if it fell on Shabbos and you can't carry. So we, we had some discussions, so why can't you carry? Isn't Jerusalem a walled city and it doesn't have an Arab? But somehow it seems that Jerusalem didn't have an Arab or wasn't treated as though it had an Arab. So therefore, the, we, had, we were told already a few weeks ago when we learned this in the previous sugya, that they used to bring their Lulav of Nesrebim to Shul and they used to place them in the shul with their identification on them. And then the next morning when they came to shul, each person would recognize his own lulav and esrog, and he would uh, make a brocha and do the na'anum and everything was fine. That's how it was done. This we learned earlier on. Here, the mission is talking about how it, the lulav and esrog was, was taken in the base ham mikdosh itself. That, this is a little bit different. Here, the scenario is not where you have a shul in Yerushalayim during the Zman HaBais, but rather when you're in the bias itself. In the Beis HaMikdash itself, there was a shul. In the Beis HaMikdash itself, there was an Arava, there were rooms and chambers. So they would also take, um, they would take Lulav and Esrin there as well. How was it done? And we'll see 
that, that if you were going to take Lulav and Esrig in the Beis Hamikdash, matters looked a little bit different. In the Beis Hamikdash itself, rather than in a shul outside, says the Mishnah. I made that clarification because the last answer a question we might have later on. Mitzvah's Lulav, the Mitzvah of Lulav, Ketzad, how was it done? So it really only interested how it was done on the, uh, on, on the first day of Yontav that fell on the Shabbos. So, um, Yontav Rishon Shachag Eliyos B'Shabbos. If it so happens that the first day of Sukkot fell on a Shabbos, says the Mishnah, Molichen is Lulavehen Lahar Habayas, they would bring their Lulavim in advance to the Har Habayas, to the Temple Mount, on Friday afternoon. Okay? The Hachazonim, the Chazonim, Chazan here means the Shamosim. A Chazan wasn't someone with a good voice. Uh, the, the Chazan is actually someone who looks after the administration of the shul. Nowadays we might call him Gabai or something similar. Um, but he was called in, in Mishneh times, he's referred to as a Chazan. So the Chazan, a Chazan in Mechablin Mehem, they would. Uh, be, they would receive all these thousands of lulavim, because we're talking about many thousands of people who might want to bring their lulavim to the base Hamikdash. They would be mekabel mehem. They would receive them, if you like. It would be handed to them for their safekeeping. The sodrinosom, and they would arrange them al gabe itstaba on a platform. We'll see what this means in a moment. The haskenim and the older people. If you were not one of the, if you were a member of the Knesset Hanasi, and you didn't want to press yourself in with all the other crowds to um, hand over your lulav and esrig to the chazonim, because you, you know, you might fall over, you were not really that uh, mobile, then there was a different etzer. Here was, here there was one, it was um, accessible to wheelchairs, if you like. This is the, this is the wheelchair accessible option. Hazekenim manichen eshalehen balishka. They would leave their lulavim and esrogim, balishka, in a special chamber, a special room. They wouldn't hand it over to the chazan to stick into some platform somewhere, but they would actually be given a special room because of their age. They would be allowed to um, use a more uh, um, accessible system for them in order to deposit their arba minim and then later the next day um, to recover them. And in this chamber, Umalamdim uh, Osam Loma, the, um, <coughs> the Chachamim and the Kohanim in the Beis Amikdash would train or teach all the people to make the following stipulation. We didn't see this in the last time we talked about shuls. This is going to be very special. Kol mi shemagia lulavo biyodo. Any person, the first lulav he picks up, this is not for the skenim so much. This is for the people who had in their thousands deposited their lulavim with the chazanim. They come the next day. So before they pick up their lulavim, or indeed when they actually place their lulavim with the chazan, they should each, every man, should make the following stipulation. Tomorrow, anyone who gets my lulav it should be considered gifted to him. Why is that? It's because by the, in the next day, thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands of people allow, arrive, arrive at the Har Habayis. It's impossible for them to all find their own Lulav and Esrik. Yeah, it's impossible. So really, essentially, they have to pick up anything. Any Lulav and Esrik that's given to them should be the one they use. But we have a problem. On the first day of Sukkot, it's the Lulav and Esrik has to be yours, as we said before many times, Shalochem, um, it should be Lochem, it has to belong to you. So therefore, before you hand your Lulav and Esrik in, you have to have a Kavana that you are going to gift your own personal Lulav and Esrik to whoever is, it is handed to the next morning. And therefore, anyone who hate, takes your lulav the next morning, it belongs to them because that was a tenai, that was a condition made. 
at the time at which those who love him given in. This is the only way practically they could arrange so many people to come into the base, Amikdash, and to get the lulav, uh, and, and to get a lulav that really belongs to them by this particular sort of, you might call it a lulav fiction. It isn't a, really a fiction, because we said before, a person can make, uh, in Jewish law, you can make a condition and a condition of a transfer of ownership, and that is valid. So uh, even though you're not transferring it directly to someone, all you're doing is making the stipulation which says, tomorrow, anyone who gets hold of my lulav, it is theirs, which means that you come there and you're picking up somebody else's, they made that stipulation. Anyone who picks up yours, you made that stipulation. So everyone now can bench lulav and esrit with a lulav and esrit that has become theirs through um, this particular stipulation. That's what the mission says. However, and here we have one of those incredible um, confessions that the Mishnah has about the, um, um, the foibles of, of human being and their uh, impatience and irascibility. The Mishnah goes on to say that this system was a complete and abject failure. Lamacha, on the next day, this means it once happened, that on the next day, in other words, Shabbos morning, Mashkimin, Uboyim, the people came in in order to get their lulav and esrik, having deposited them with this stipulation the night before. And the chazonim would take out these huge bundles of lulavim and esrogin and place them on the table in front of them, hoping that everybody would just take the first one that came to hand, because that was the idea. That was entirely the system that had been implemented, that you take whichever one comes to hand. However, knowing people and human nature, that didn't happen. What did it lead to? Widespread chaos and anarchy. Each person would try and snatch what he, the nicest one or the one he thought belonged to him rather than just accept anything handed. It led to blows. The people come to the base of Midrash, very nice, and they start slugging each other. Why? Because they don't want to take one that they're just handed to them on the basis it was stipulated by someone that it would be Hefka and they'll be able to do it. Why, why should people be so impatient and volatile? Well, maybe people know each other, what are they like? You know, we all label our Lulav and Estrip and we always cast aspersions on anyone else's. At the same time, there's an additional factor going on over here. If I'm going to make a brock on the Lulav and Estrip, I have to know it's mine on the first day of Sukkot. Well, maybe I should assume it's mine because everyone has been trained that the previous evening before they deposited it, they made this stipulation that whoever picks it up belongs to them. But can you trust everyone as having made the right stipulation? Suppose I'm unlucky and I pick up a lulav and the owner, original owner of that lulav when he deposited it forgot to make that stipulation. Well, it doesn't belong to me now when I pick it up and I made a brachal of atola and I have not been makai my mitzvah of Arab Aminim. So there will be people who will be suspicious that whoever was the donor of the lulav they were given had actually made that stipulation. And therefore they would be looking for the one that looked like theirs, the one that had their label on or their tag on or something like that. And that led to chaos. So what do you do when you see a system is chaotic and has failed to work? And we find many examples of this, the Gemara does bring many examples where a particular takana was made, was found to have been a failure, and Chazal had to go back and try some other system, because we failed, the system has failed us, or we failed the system. Because Sheroa based in, says the Mishnah at the end, Sheboli de Sakona, that this was leading to danger, Pikuach Nefesh, people are fighting over Lulav and Nesrogim, they couldn't have any more of this. Hiskino, they instituted, don't bother bringing your lil of an esri to shul, to the base of Mikdash, sorry. Make your bracha at home. And if you want to come in later on, well, I'm fine. If you do that, by the way, uh, you're coming in. It's a, it's a shame because people wanted to do this mitzvah. However, there's a point at which the, um, the sechus you get, the merit, but doing a mitzvah is cancelled out by the uh, uh, Avera, 
of people uh, fighting with each other on Yontif. So they said people have to leave a lulav and esrik at, at home because there's no way they can bring them into shul. Remember the last time we met this su subject, I've already mentioned it, it's, as far as people bringing their lulav and esrik into shul on Shabbos, on Friday afternoon, the next day they went to shul and they found theirs and they made a, made a broch and everything was fine. So here, there is a difference. Here we're talking about the Beis Amikdash itself. The system failed when it comes to the Beis Amikdash. And that is because a system like this or any system can work when there are only relatively small numbers of people. So if there are only relatively small numbers, like in the shul, and then everyone brings their Lula Vanessa on Friday night, uh, Friday afternoon, and the next morning, everyone can uh, walk around, see what belongs to them, no one's going to punch each other over here. People can identify their lulav and isra very easily, and the system works. The problem is, once you try to import that sort of system into a, uh, an area which is so busy and so swarming with people, as the base Hamikdash, it fails. Everyone brings their stuff on Friday afternoon, and there's civil war on the Shabbos morning. So that's why they had to change the system uh, and ensure that uh, people actually um, we're fulfilling their mitzvah of Arba Minim at home. I just thought I'd take, give you here a little bit more of a uh, picture of what's going on. Um, are we seeing, well, okay. So this is again, is a, is a, this is actually, I think, from the, uh, the, what is now in the Israel Museum, you know, this great big, uh, incredible model of Yerush Line in the Second Temple times. It used to be at this hotel in, in Bayt Begun, and then it was moved to uh, the uh, grounds of the Israel Museum. This is part of it. That's why it looks a bit dirty. It's probably got a little bit um, uh, stained with, with time and with the rain, etc. But this is a real stone model. Lovely. So here, I wanted to show you these colonnades. This whole area outside, the actual base on Mikdosh is really only this rectangle. We see it over here, this rectangle. That's the actual base on Mikdosh. But this base on Mikdosh is within the flat area of Al Har Habayis, which is where the Al Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock, etc., is the whole flat area at the top that we see when we're at the Kotel. The Kotel is one side of one part of the Har Habayis. So here, this floor level over here. This floor level over here, etc., is part of the Har Habayis, not the Beis Hamikdash itself. Around the Har Habayis, there, were the, there was this colonnaded area. You see these columns, and they went all the way around. It was all very, very magnificent, as you can see. And this colonnaded area was covered over, was was roofed over. Can you see? So people could actually sit inside here, and there were benches and seats and platforms inside between the columns. And then we protect protected from the sun and from the rain. It was very uh, user friendly. You can imagine this was a great attraction. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. When you look at the actual base of Mikdosh, here you are seeing the following structure. Over here is, is what's called the Ezra's Noshim. You would come in, shall we say here, or many other places, you go into the Ezra's Noshim. This is not where the Carbonus were offered, but it was, the, it, was an, it was an entry area, it was a, a lobby area in advance. It's open, as you can see, to the skies. Over here, one, two, three, four, you can just about see four corner chambers. These are actually covered over, they're rooms. Now the Mishnahis actually tell us what these chambers are for. They all had certain designations, but they would be used for various, for various things. They were covered over, they could be warmed, for example. When a person went through this Azara and up these steps, this would take them, this Ezra's Noshim would take them through these gates, the Nicanor gates, into the Azara itself, which you don't see properly because of the, the perspective. In the, towards the end of the Azara, there's this enormous structure, that's the Heichal, 
itself, a sanctuary. And at the back of that is the Kodesh Kadoshim. Going through these gates, you get through to the uh, where the menorah was and also through a further curtain to where the Aron, ha Aron would have been. In the second base of Mikdash, there was no Aron, but that's where it would have been. In the back of this huge chamber, it was enormously high and could be seen for, for a very, very great distance with golden, etched, uh, golden etching around the edge, these beautiful pillars in front of it, etc. That's the Heichel. The Mizbeach and everything, it cannot be seen through this perspective. So let me go through over here. Here again, you get, I've turned this round in the same configuration, right? So you've got this also in, uh, in, in portrait, if you like. You go through the gate over here, the four chambers in this cross section, one, two, three, four. Here you go through from the Ezra's Noshim into the Azara. And here's this Heichal, this grand building that you can only see you see this uh, rearing up, it's this. However, here you can see the Mizbeach, which you couldn't see before. This is the, uh, the ramp, and this is the top of the Mizbeach. And this is where the Korbanos would be flayed, and they would be, uh, uh, the dam would be taken, sprinkled on, etc. All the, all the actual ritual, uh, sacrificial aspects took place over here. And over here, there were things kept, that were, that were used for other reasons. Um, and uh, the simplest space, a shoeva, would take place over here. All sorts of um, good uses made. And if you can imagine, the harabais is around it. It's over here. This is exactly the picture, the cross section that we have of this picture. So, what we're being told over here is that the multitudes and the throngs who came in with their lulavim and esrogim and handed over their lulavim and esrogim, they were put on the, uh, we said over here, on the itztabah. The Yitztaba were the platforms within the colonnades. So this is on the Har Habais. This is where the, the great um, uh, large masses came in to deposit on this, before it was found to be a failure, um, to deposit their Lulavim with the Chazonim over here and over here, and probably around all four of the walls it would be like that. There'll be large areas of colonnades. So the fact is that they could be placed inside on tables. They were this way, sheltered from the sun, and therefore they would keep fresh till the next morning. You can't just leave them out in the sun or in the rain. So therefore here they're protected from the damp and they were protected from uh, the sun. And this is, and you needed large expanse like this because there'll be tens of thousands of lulobin coming in. However, the Mishnah went on to say that the Sakanian, the elders, they were allowed to keep their stuff in a lishka. So they could come to a room like this. Probably there were more rooms rather than the rooms inside here, these four. There were probably rooms, special rooms, much smaller ones, where the Sakanian would come in, where they would not be so crushed um, because there may only been a few hundred of them or a few thousand, whereas of the younger generation, there were a few tens of thousands, scores of thousands. Uh, they would leave their stuff over here. Anyway, the system failed. Too many people, too much crush. It's like going to a very, very busy kiddush. At the end, you have more chalant over your jacket than actually goes into your mouth. So they had to suspend this system and people had to take their lulav and esri at home. Okay, that, that helps to, 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 to paint the picture. We once did discuss some of this, I think, uh, many years ago. We were talking about actually the service of the Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur ceremony and where the, um, uh, the um, whereabouts of the Kohen Godel when he was doing all the aspects of the Avoda and we sort of did a, a, a sketch and we showed him coming in and out and up and down and the side and, uh, you know, everything he did, all his steps were choreographed around uh, a picture very much like this. Okay, that's it. That's the end of the Mishnah. Uh, it's been a nice varied mission. Let's move to the Gomorrah, just to cancel the share. Okay, let's move to the Gomorrah now. Says the Gomorrah, am I? Now, this is nice, and that lovely, delightful question of the, um, of the Gemara, which is usual. You've got to read the answer to understand what the question is, because the, 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 the Gemara asks a question on a detail on the Mishnah simply with a question, why? It's very much like a child, isn't it? You know, a child comes and just says, why? You don't, you're not quite sure what his why is sometimes. Over here, the Gemara says, why? Why what? So the question here implied is, why should you not be allowed to take a lulav on if Shabbos falls on any other day other than the first day? Since we said that at the time of the Beis Hamikdash, there's a mitzvah all seven days. Okay, 
The first day that falls on Shabbos, we said you do take Lulav and Esrik somehow. That's so the taking of a mitzvah, taking of the Lulav and Esrik at the time of the Beis HaMikdash here was, uh, uh, did override the risks of taking it on Shabbos. But why is it that if Shabbos falls, shall we say, on the seventh day, you don't take it on the seventh day? Why not? If you have to take it all seven days, you should be allowed to take it on the seventh day, even if it isn't Shabbos, even if it is Shabbos. Uh, it's, it's one of the seven Torah days for taking Lulav and Esra in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Beis HaMikdash, remember, but outside the Beis HaMikdash, it's a mitzvah for all seven days. Why does it matter which day is Shabbos of those seven days? You should be able to take them on all of those seven days. That's the implied question. So the Gemara answers, well, first of all, the Gemara tries something out. Um, uh, if it's because of, it, it, what is the worst that, that the Gemara suspects? What's the worst damage the Gemara suspects you might be doing if you take a lulav on Shabbos? So here the Gemara is going to think, maybe it's to do with muktza, tiltul muktza. It says the Gemara, tiltul ba'almahu. The worst that you're doing, the Gemara is ignoring the question of carrying it through the streets, which is something we know about, to get to the Beis Amikosh. The Gemara here thinks that maybe we should say that the Lulav and Esrig are Muktza on Shabbos. And therefore, because of Muktza, you don't take them. Now you will say, what are they Muktza on Shabbos? on the seventh day, why shouldn't they also be on the first day? So somehow we believe that the first day carries additional Torah weight. That's what we'll see in a moment. Um, but if it's, that's what we'll see, this is implied. Tiltob al-Mahu, the worst it could be is carrying muktza, taking muktza into the hand. Let the mitzvah, let, let the mitzvah of, of Sukkot be docha this um, Issa of Tiltul Muktza on Shabbos. Why? If there is a mitzvah in our Torah to take Lulav and Esrik all seven days, what is the suspected barrier to taking on Shabbos, says the Gemara, that it's Muktza? Well, Muktza is just an Issa bonum. There is no mitzvah in the Torah. There is no Avera in the Torah of Muktza. It's a rabbinical decree. There's a machlokas as to why this degree was put, decree was put in place. Um, you know, you shouldn't carry things. When I say carry, you shouldn't handle. That's the word. The word carry has, in fact, um, uh, ramifications here that I'm trying to include. Um, it is to do with handling. You shouldn't handle certain things that are not needed for Shabbos itself. You don't handle stones that have no purpose. You don't take a twig of a tree. So the Gemara suspects over here, maybe the problem that we have with Shabbos and the Lulav and Esrik is what is a Lulav and Esrik? It's a plant. They're just plants. You don't just carry twigs around with you in a Shabbos. We say muksa muksa, don't touch them. So maybe you want to say that's why we shouldn't take Lulav and Esrik on Shabbos um, because L uh, and the uh, Lulav and Esrik is a mitzvah min um, to take, um, and you've got a tilt or mitzvah, a mitzvah against it. But if you have a Torah mitzvah prescribing you to take it, prescribing you to take it, and you have a uh, mitzvah drabonon forbidding you from taking it, then surely the Torah rule overrides the rabbinic rule, and you should take. That's what Gomorrah thinks. You should be allowed to take it there for on this seventh day if it falls on Shabbos. Why should there be a problem? Muksa should be pushed out of the way because the Torah rule of taking, taking it all seven days surely should be the stronger. So I'm a rabbi, so the a rabbi answers no. Gezeira shemi yitlenu beyodo beyetse etzel boki lil mode. So this is a famous Gezeira's rabbi, the yaavirenu abba amus bishus harabim. Now uh, that may be already on your next sheet, but it's the end of the particular statement of Rabbah. Rabbah says, the concern isn't Mukta. As far as Mukta is concerned, there isn't a problem. And it's certainly true that taking the Lul of an Esra being a Torah uh, requirement would override the Isor of handling Mukta, which is only rabbinic. But there's an additional uh, concern that we have over here. And that is that you might carry it through the streets. This is what we've always talked about before. Where there's no Erev, you might carry it through the streets. You might carry it four hours. You may take it from the outside to the inside through a Rishul Sarabim. And then 
if you did that, you would violate a Torah Issa, not a rabbinic Issa, it's not, not just like Mutzah. You're not allowed to carry in the streets for Amas um, Din Torah. And therefore, in order to protect the Din Torah of not carrying on Shabbos, we, um, we waive the requirement to take Lulav and Esrig if, um, if Sukkot, if, Shabbat, if, if it falls on Shabbos, other than on the first day, that's what the Gemara wants to say, on the first day we're not going to waive it, but if it's on any other day, we will waive the mitzvah, uh, we won't waive it, we won't shake it and wave it, but we will omit uh, performing the mitzvah of Lulav and Esrit because we might come to carry through the streets. That itself is a big question itself. So what, because of a fear, you cancel a mitzvah? So this is a well-known discussion that the Chachamim have the right to put aside a mitzvah min ha Torah if they put it aside in a passive form. The Chachamim can't override actively a mitzvah min ha Torah. And there's a mitzvah in Torah to take Lulav and Esrik all seven days at the time of the Beis Amikdash in Yerushalayim. So they can't override that actively, but passively they can. What do I mean by passively? It's what's called here Sheval Tasa. If they just take, tell you to sit and not do something, that is a passive violation. And the Chazah have a license to mandate a passive violation. They can say to you, don't take Lulav and Esrik. Because by not taking it, you are passively violating the mitzvah of the of Esrit. As opposed to, for example, they can't tell you to steal because that's an active violation. That's not a passive violation. You steal by doing something. You passively violate Lulav and Esrit by not doing something. Chazal have the power vested in them to actually legislate to passively violate. And that's why they can say, because we are concerned that you might come to carry through the streets on Shabbos, which would be an active violation of Shabbos. We mandate that you should passively violate the din of Arab Aminim, even in Yerushalayim and even at the time of the Mikdash. That's the, the, the general um, interpretation of this Gezeras Rabbah. And as the Gemara is going to say, this interpretation is the same one we use um, to mandate no chauffeur blowing on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, when, as it does often happen, it falls on Shabbos um, uh, and Megillah. We, we do a Megillah for the same reason. Um, and there are various other um, um, put-asides that we have because of this fear. Um, think about chauffeur as well, how important a mitzvah it is. You know, that really the first day is Minha Torah. That first day falls on Shabbos, we don't blow chauffeur. Why? Again, it's a passive violation of Tekiah Sheva. Torah says you should blow, but we're afraid that if we allow you to blow, you might carry this through the streets, you might take it to an expert to try and repair it or whatever it is. And therefore, we want to protect against the active violation of Shabbos. Um, and we rather you passively violate by not um, blowing chauffeur. Over here, by the way, why are we afraid, does the rabbi say, that you might carry through the streets? It's interesting to see what his fear is. He doesn't actually say you might take it um, from home through the streets to the um, Beis HaMikdash. He says, You might take it to an expert to learn how to use the, um, the Lul of an Esrik. Sounds a bit strange here. In other words, I have a little of an esteric over here. I might now, because I'm not quite sure how what I do with it, I'm so flustered. I'll go to uh, to my friend living a few streets away and ask him, what do I do with this? Which way around do I hold it? You know, uh, what happens if I drop it? How do I do the now new him? You know, which way do I turn first? How do I rattle it? That's what, because that's where Rabbah puts his, the suspicion over here. A person may feel that he, he's inadequate. And the same with the chauffeur. He might go to, to learn, to, he may feel that he hasn't got the notes quite right. And the Baal care might then go to an expert to, to, to treat, teach him in the last, last minute. You imagine this is last minute. This is on the Shabbos morning. If they allow you to take the chauffeur, you might rush to, to your expert to teach you how to blow properly and then go on from there to shore. Then you'll carry it with you. Um, or you're carried from the shul quickly to the expert. But one way or another, the, the need to learn is so strong that you might carry it through the streets and then you'll actively violate. So we protect 
the mitzvah of Shabbos against an active violation of Shabbos by a passive violation of the mitzvah. And that's why if the, if the seventh day falls on Shabbos, for example, on Sukkot, even in the, at the time of the Beis Hamikdash, they didn't, they didn't take it on, uh, on Shabbos uh, in case a person might come and wish to learn how to, to use this little of an As we'll see, And the, the first day was separate. We'll see why the first day is separate. Maybe next time we'll talk about whether, because that should be a problem with the first day as well. Maybe you'll come and take it through the streets for someone to learn. So the first day falls on Shabbos. Why did they allow you to take your Lulav and Esrit to Shul at that time or to the base on me? Because we'll see that Gemara is going to make a slight differentiation here between the first day and the seventh day and say that on the first day, it is more mafurish, it is more explicit in the Torah that you take the Lulav and Esrit. And on the last day or any other day than the second than the first day, it is implicit and not explicit. That will get you scratching your heads as well. Why is it more explicit, more implicit? Maybe we'll, we'll discuss this next time. Okay, so we'll um, we'll stop over here. We we'll just stop the recording. I think I stopped recording, but it doesn't seem to have. Oh.